Hello, I'm Jeremy Allaire, and this is The Money Movement, a show where we explore the issues and ideas in this brave new world of digital currency and blockchains. We are 20 episodes into the show. We've had nearly 60 guests, including some fantastic uh, former uh, financial industry, government leaders, regulators, startups, um, an incredibly diverse range of, of conversations that we've had uh, over these past months. It's been really rewarding and I think also has grown uh, with thousands of listeners and viewers around the world. Um, this has really grown and, and we're very excited about continuing these conversations. I think when I started the show, I really thought about this as a, a place where I could help to convene conversations um, on the topics that mattered uh, around digital currency and blockchains. And uh, that convening of conversations is, is really a, a critical thing that we all need to do as we're exploring and learning. And there's so much change happening in this space you know, by the day, by the hour, by the week, et cetera. So we've really been blessed with the quality of those conversations and the quality of the engagement. Um, and, uh, and so you know, also just want to thank all of you as listeners, viewers, as audience, um, really appreciate your continued interest in it. Um, if you've liked the show, um, please, please, please hit subscribe on YouTube, like this, follow us on Apple, on Spotify, and of course, share this with a friend, share this with people you know. We want to widen uh, more and more people into these conversations on global digital currency. So today, um, speaking of widening the conversation, we're going to be turning it around uh, and bringing more people into the conversation uh, by having people bring in questions directly to me. So this is our first Ask Me Anything Money movement, and we've really uh, seen fantastic questions come in. We've sourced questions from many of our key stakeholders, uh, from the audience via direct messages, emails, social media, via uh, employees, partners, and most importantly, have been able to source some fantastic questions from many of the guests who've been on the show as well. So I put them in a place uh, uh, where we were having conversations. I was asking a lot of questions. I wanted to hear their questions too. And so you're gonna hear from questions from some fantastic uh, former guests of Money Movement today as well. So the format here is I'm gonna try and answer as many of these as possible, but we've, we've been really blessed with a lot of questions. And I think what we're gonna end up doing is a bonus on-demand second episode to answer even more of those questions. And every question and every answer is also going to be published as a standalone video, as a standalone video clip. And so again, subscribe on YouTube and you'll get to see all those questions and answers blasted out as well. We'll be pushing all that out for everyone. So uh, let's get started. Um, We've got a question here that that came in from um, a Twitter handle, American Do. Um, there's a couple of parts to the question. The first is, uh, do you see Bitcoin and other proof of work assets surviving in the mid to long term with the International Monetary Fund and entities like them calling for the implementation of greener technologies in the digital currency space? Um, so. For those that, that, that aren't aware, um, proof of work is a security model for securing um, blockchains, public blockchains, and it is computationally intense uh, and resource intense. And I think there's um, been over time varying um, degrees of, of hype, uh, oftentimes also misinformation, but also some reality that um, the mining uh, model that supports proof of work um, would you know, cause significant kinds of, of emissions and that we need to move from proof of work to, uh, to less um, energy intensive uh, models. So I, I think a couple things here. I think the, the first is I, I do think 
um, one should really look into this more closely. There have been lots of studies on this, and there's been a lot of uh, analysis around this, some very, very good research. I think one of the things that's been most noteworthy, however, is you know, if you're if you're close to companies and players in the kind of vertical scale industrial uh, digital currency mining industry, um, many of these are are very large firms that have, you know, really focused on trying to become as energy efficient as possible. The the concept being that if your energy costs are lower that your effectively margin is higher for every block that you're able to mine. And so we've seen incredible uh, efforts to build in geothermal uh, environments, solar powered environments, uh, water powered environments. Uh, we've also seen you know, uh, mining attached to uh, nuclear power plants. I mean, it's been fascinating to watch this sort of um, effort to you know, essentially get you know, marginal value out of each block mine by becoming more energy uh, efficient. And in fact, the, the hardware infrastructure, the cooling infrastructure, all the infrastructure that goes around this, it, it naturally drives towards lower unit costs in terms of energy intensity. So I, I think that's something that um, how that plays out over time from a data center energy efficiency perspective, Bitcoin mining and other proof of work mining data centers are pursuing some of the most green energy efficient models in the world. With all that said, when you think about this at scale, as the as the hash rates um, become you know more competitive, as the value of something like Bitcoin rises into the hundreds of thousands of dollars per Bitcoin, this could continue to be an issue. Now, I think whether a, 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 a supranational consortium of, of countries or or um, a given government is recommending or suggesting that that models evolve is one thing, but I think the market's already way, way ahead of, of governments on this. So obviously Ethereum 2, which is a major initiative to evolve the security and consensus model for Ethereum is moving to a proof of stake model. Uh, proof of stake models are fundamentally more energy efficient, relying more on commodity uh, compute uh, and commodity high performance computing in some cases. And um, that is, is I think that really the more fundamental change. That's not gonna change Bitcoin, but it's certainly for, for many of these um, third generation blockchains that are designed to meet the scaling needs of really broad-based adoption. Um, I, I think that that shift is sort of naturally happening. And so whether there's you know uh, international organizations saying it's important or not, the market is certainly you know already, already moving to that. Um, so, uh, Another question um, here actually from uh, Joanna, uh, with the dominance of USD based stablecoins, do you foresee a similar rise of other denominated stablecoins, GBP, Euro, Yen, uh, to facilitate business and retail transactions? Or do you think there'll be more of a shift to a USD as global currency? Um, there's a lot in this question, and we could talk about this for an entire episode, and maybe this is actually a good idea for uh, an episode that we could pursue the, the rise of, uh, of other fiat digital currency stablecoins. Um, you know, there's a few things here. I think clearly um, fiat digital currencies um, that are, you know, issue, you know fiat uh, backed uh, currency, di digital currencies that are issued on public blockchains that run on public blockchain infrastructure have huge advantages. And of course, in a given regional environment, whether you're the UK or the Eurozone or Japan or an emerging market in, in, uh, in another part of the world, the advantages of, of having these fiat digital currencies is really significant. And I think we're going to see absolutely a proliferation of other fiat digital currencies uh, from the private sector, from public-private uh, sector um, uh, collaborations, and, and actually a stated mission of Center Consortium, um, which Circle is a member of and, and which governs USDC, is to expand the Center stablecoins into other uh, both reserve currency stablecoins and emerging market stablecoins. And there's, I think, a good amount of interest in that. So we absolutely see that expanding. And I think at the core, this is part of the shift towards businesses and individuals wanting to use digital currencies in everyday commerce, in 
digital commerce, in payments, in business to business payments. If you want to build a, a programmable contract to intermediate a, a business relationship and the counterparties are all in Germany, you're going to want that to be based on a euro stablecoin. Um, you're not going to want that to be based on a dollar stablecoin. So clearly, as this goes more mainstream, that's going to happen. Um, on the other hand, there's also, I think, a, a broader, um, both geopolitical um, as well as macroeconomic uh, and, and more fundamentally kind of trade economy um, uh, argument that digital currencies, which go over the top of the internet, they can be deployed peer to peer, they can you know, transact with anyone with a piece of software on the internet that um, you know, really reserve currencies that are widely used in everyday trade, uh, where transactions between counterparties are denominated in those reserve currencies, that those will grow. Um, and because the, the combination of sort of an already widely accepted and used reserve currency like the USD and the internet is going to actually cement, further cement, um, for example, the, the dollar's role as a currency on the internet. Um, and so we're now talking about the growth of internet based uh, digital currencies and, and USD is, is very well positioned. And I think it's one of the reasons why in today's world of digital currency, the, you know, the dollar based stable coins have grown dramatically faster than other stable coins that have been introduced in, in different regions around the world. Um, over the long run, though, um, I, I think there is a shift. Um, and I think this is a, a deeper political and economic consideration, which is that in a world where everyone is connected on the internet and people can kind of vote for what economic system they want to participate in with their smartphone in the same way they can uh, kind of interact with people everywhere from a communications perspective. Um, I do think that there will be a shift towards more global currency models. And um, it's unlikely to me over the long run that that's going to be just the dollar. I think over the long run, we will see synthetic global digital currencies um, that are composed of leading reserve currencies. But I think we'll also continue to see um, digital currencies from many, many countries and we'll have uh, real time convertibility across those at virtually no cost. So lots in the question, uh, lots in, in the answer as well. Um, a question that came in actually, uh, it was an anonymous question, um, uh, which I'll read here, which is, I work in the crypto industry and was drawn to it because of how I thought it could change society for the better. With all of the attention now on companies and their views of employee activism, where does Circle stand on all of this? I think this is a great question. And uh, we got this question came in a couple of days ago. And I thought, you know, what we could do is actually um, share something more explicitly, which is um, we're publishing right now as we speak Circle's mission and values um, document. This is a, a mission and values document that um, we uh, updated in January of this year and, and really is a foundation for how we think about our, our corporation, our mission, what we're trying to do. And it's something that, in fact, every employee in our company is is sort of measured against um, when we even think about performance reviews, you know, how are they aligning with that? And I'm not gonna read through the whole thing. It's, it's, a, um, it's a, a, a sizable document, it's up on our blog now, um, but just at a high level, our mission is to raise global economic prosperity through programmable internet commerce. And the opening paragraph of the mission is states, Circle was founded on a belief that blockchains and digital currency will rewire the global economic system, creating a fundamentally more open, inclusive, efficient, and integrated world economy. We envision a global economy where people and businesses everywhere can more freely connect and transact with each other through a system that has the reach and accessibility of the internet and knows no borders or boundaries. We believe such a system can raise prosperity for people and companies everywhere. So we break down that mission and, and the meaning behind the core words in that mission. And then we talk about our values, that we are a, a multi-stakeholder company. And we think about our stakeholders as our customers, our shareholders, our employees and our families, and also our local communities. And this is a really key thing that I wanna emphasize, which is 
corporations do not exist in a vacuum. Corporations are multi-stakeholder. Uh, we are social institutions that exist in the context of our local communities. And we have obligations to those local communities. And things like Black Lives Matter do matter. And I think for, for us, that's woven into our values, that's woven into what we expect from our employees, that they are engaged in their local communities. That it means that we as a corporation are engaged in global scale issues such as climate change and sustainability. And we cannot avoid um, these, these issues that are both local and global, and it's woven into uh, our mission. There are a lot of other pieces um, to that, which, which I'll encourage all of you to, to take a look at. And we wanted to make this available to anyone that's going to interact with Circle, whether you're a potential employee, um, whether you're a regulator, uh, a partner, a customer. Um, we want people to know what we stand for. Lots more good questions here. Um, here's a question from Twitter handle Zoom Call Saul. How does the new OCC interpretive letter change things for USDC? Will you collaborate better with banks? It's a really good question. Uh, and without getting into all the details, uh, the, the OCC, the uh, main regulator for, for national banks in the United States issued a, a letter uh, specifically clarifying that, that national banks under its supervision could provide reserve accounts um, or accounts to uh, hold the reserves that are held uh, backing full reserve uh, regulated uh, digital dollar stablecoins. Um, and I think this is a very, very positive development for USDC. I think it's, it's a very positive development on, on many fronts. It, it sends a message that Within the US financial system, digital dollar stable coins that are compliant, regulated, and full reserve are a legitimate infrastructure in the US economy. We hope to see more from the OCC on, on this topic, um, not just for how banks might uh, hold reserves, but ultimately participate and, and, and hold and use uh, these types of digital currencies. And, and of course, we see the enormous amount of payment system innovation that's coming from this. And, and we are actually seeing more and more regulated financial institutions, both banks and fintechs and, and others getting involved and starting to implement and support USDC in different ways. So in terms of collaborating better with banks, I do think so. I think that we'll find more and more banks at every level of the economic system um, wanting to interact with things like USDC um, as a new uh, payment system innovation. Uh, I expect uh, that it's gonna grow um, the capacity that's available for, for holding these reserves as well. Um, you know, as, as we've seen in the past months, um, you know, USDC itself has grown from a, around 400 million USDC in circulation to over 2.5 billion USDC in circulation. And as the use cases proliferate, as, as more and more um, financial institutions get involved, it's not unreasonable to imagine this in the tens of billions of USDC in circulation in the not too distant future. And we need the, the, the stability and the risk management and the oversight of national banks to, to support that and be involved in that. And so I, I do think we'll see a lot more collaboration with banks uh, over, uh, over the next year. So I want to take a, a question, actually two questions from a former guest of the show. Uh, these questions are from uh, Larry Summers, uh, former uh, Secretary of Treasury um, and advisor to the National Economic uh, Council, head for the Obama administration, and obviously a very distinguished economist himself and, and a guest that we had here to talk about a wide range of things. Um, but Larry asks, uh, the first question, which do you think crypto threatens most? A, wire transfer, money transfer businesses. B, gold as a store of value. Or C, traditional approaches to payments. So there's a multiple or a, uh, I, there's, there's not a, uh, uh, an answer which is, uh, you know, maybe, maybe both, but I'm, I'm going to give a slightly nuanced answer on this. I think that um, in the near term, it really depends on which crypto we're talking about. So cryptocurrencies that are fundamentally designed to be scarce store of value assets like Bitcoin, obviously threaten gold 
and, and, the, and the role of gold as a store of value because uh, a digital currency, a digital asset such as Bitcoin has far superior characteristics uh, to gold. And so it absolutely threatens to kind of take share as a, uh, a risk asset uh, or an asset to, to hold um, in lieu of um, what is taking place uh, in terms of you know, sovereigns uh, and, their, and their behavior from a monetary perspective. Um, so I think uh, certainly um, in that case, but other crypto assets that are really digital commodities that support these broader public networks for transaction settlement, for computing resources, things like Ether um, and Ethereum and, and many other third generation chains. I think that uh, the combination of stable coins with those crypto assets um, in, the, in the short run, short to medium term, I think are very threatening to the traditional wire settlement money transfer business. You know, many of the fastest adopters of digital dollar stable coins are firms that make international payments and where they are seeing that they can settle a payment in dollars at the speed of the internet uh, for very low cost uh, with a settlement finality in, in new blockchains in as quickly as you know seconds or even milliseconds. Uh, and that's really significant. And I think in the near term is, is going to be um, most threatening there. Over the mid to long term, clearly traditional approaches to payment um, are going to be very threatened. And so um, this infrastructure as third generation blockchains come online and as uh, more consumer facing companies that touch hundreds of millions to billions of people implement stable coins, uh, that is going to have a major impact on traditional approaches to payments, uh, the traditional networks, traditional models, and um, that I think is going to play out over the next few years. So that was the first question. Thank you, Larry. And the second question uh, was, when will the absence of crypto in a portfolio be more surprising than its presence? Uh, I, I love this question. Um, I think, um, you know, there's, there's different measures uh, that we have, say, in the United States or in China or, or other markets that are, that are very active in crypto, like Japan or Korea. Um, and, uh, and, and clearly today, the, the minority of people have crypto in their portfolio. And, and there's been a lot of discussion about, you know, at, at what point do all the institutional asset managers have crypto? At what point are there, you know, ETFs that allow individuals to, to hold on to this? Um, I, I think... Um, we're, we're very much continuing to see this kind of uh, you know, growth in mainstream adoption. I think we're going to see big milestones. Um, there's rumors that major players like PayPal would say allow every Venmo user to purchase and hold Bitcoin. Um, and so generationally, I think young people through kind of Gen Xers, I think the majority uh, are going to have crypto in their portfolio very soon. I think that's within the next two years. Uh, if you look at the broader, uh, broader demographics and, and scope, um, maybe longer. However, it may show up in people's portfolio inadvertently if you're holding a certain index fund or mutual fund or you're, you have a pension with a, a, a state uh, or uh, you're, you're in an endowment. Um, many of these are, are holding crypto through investments in other funds. Uh, and so when you kind of pierce through all of that, I think within you know two uh, two to three years we'll be at a point where it'll be more surprising to find people who don't have crypto exposure than do. Uh, another question from a, a former guest, um, Kyle Samani from Multicoin Capital. Um, he he asks, what is the biggest demand driver for USDC going forward? Um, it's been fascinating to watch the different forces driving demand for USDC. Uh, we've seen growth in, in crypto as a whole as a driver of USDC. We've seen dollarization and uh, uh, businesses and individuals in emerging markets around the world demanding more USDC uh, because of its superiority as a, as a store of value and as a settlement mechanism. Um, and we've seen growth in the use of, of USDC in, in lending markets. And so a huge driver has been um, in some ways taking the base layer of blockchains as a kind of operating system and then the apps on top of it being fiat money and you know, lending. 
Um, and those are apps that tie together in a really natural way. And as we've seen the, the protocols for fiat money like USDC and the protocols for lending uh, proliferate, we've seen huge uh, demand drivers for those as well. Um, I think as we look out um, over the next year, I think there's going to be two, uh, two very big drivers. I think, um, and I know you've asked for the biggest, um, uh, I think um, growth in essentially digital dollar money markets um, is going to be an enormous driver. I think the ability for the internet to establish and coordinate supply and demand for capital over internet-based markets is going to outperform the way in which that happens in many other parts of the financial system. And individuals and business owners and treasuries and others are going to be drawn to participate in those markets. And when you think about the scale and size of those markets where you take currency money markets as a whole, this is a massive multi-trillion dollar space. And I think um, as the growth in interest rate markets and money markets and other types of things happens on the internet, both through uh, centralized platforms and decentralized platforms, that is gonna be a, a very big driver. I think the second biggest driver is gonna be the rapid rise of the use of USDC in um, global settlements um, as uh, businesses, as fintechs, as um, uh, other application developers see the advantages of this. And that's gonna drive um, significant adoption as well. Thank you, Kyle. Okay. <laughs> Um, kind of moving on, uh, lots and lots of other questions. Um, so this is a, a question from uh, Julian Howe, former guest on The Money Movement um, with Bank Frick, uh, which is a, a, a European Union bank, also a, a bank that's very active in, in digital assets. Uh, he, he asked a number of questions. Um, I'm going to uh, take one of his, which is, Recently, the European Commission has published the first draft of the coming crypto asset regulations. Stablecoins are a very big topic, especially ones that the Commission classifies as quote unquote significant ones. What is your take on the proposed regulation? And what do you think is the effect on the adoption of USDC as well as stablecoins in general? Would you view the proposed regulation as a good step forward towards mainstream adoption or rather as a step backward? I think this is a, uh, there's a, there's a broader question here, which is whether it's through uh, guidance from regulators in the US, through new laws passed in the EU, to many other approaches taking, taken within the G20 as a whole, which is going to be adopting uh, a set of recommended policy guidelines for stablecoins. The, the, the reality of, of kind of government rules and supervision of these, um, I think, important large stable coins is inevitable and I think is also very important. I think as we have rules of the road defined, that is going to dramatically increase confidence in this as a payment infrastructure. It is going to dramatically increase confidence in these stable coins as a stored value instrument uh, that business can, businesses can rely upon uh, in financial contracts, uh, that individuals uh, can experience the benefits of from a utility value perspective. So I think broadly having these rules and having them come into play is gonna be massively uh, significant in terms of mainstream adoption. I think the really critical thing here though is, and this is you know, something that we have conversations with regulators about all the time, is you know, the really critical thing is not to just take the frameworks that exist for the, the legacy electronic money systems and just try and superimpose those on top of digital currency and stable coins because there are fundamental um, breakthroughs, technical breakthroughs and fundamental innovations that stable coins make possible and we don't wanna throw the baby out with the bathwater, as we say. So for example, the ability for a stable coin to act as a bearer instrument and to, to be able to work on a peer-to-peer -peer basis globally is incredibly powerful and can unleash an enormous amount of economic value for individuals, for, the, for labor markets, for businesses. The programmability of that, if you know that you have an underlying digital money asset and it can be encapsulated and interacted with in a programmable way with a smart contract, that's fundamental as well. Some of the approaches attempt to kind of 
railroad stable coins into just being, oh, this is a, a payment, uh, an electronic money payment system. And so we got to regulate it that way. Stable coins are a lot more than that. They expand beyond that. And so I think the really critical thing is as, um, as regulators engage and as industry keeps innovating, that we work together to make sure that these breakthroughs that are ultimately gonna raise global economic prosperity for everyone are not lost and that we can embrace them and that the fundamental risks that are important around consumers not being defrauded or uh, around the fundamental integrity and security of, of these systems, um, the fiduciary responsibilities for those that deal in these, those kinds of things are really key. It's a good question, Julian, thank you. I got a, another question from uh, another guest as well. Um, Federico Ost from Claros. Um, he asks, I'm from Argentina, a country which throughout history has seen a number of currency and financial crises, including hyperinflation, banks and governments confiscating people's savings, etc. How can all these tools you presented over the episodes of the money movement help me? How can they make life better for all of us living in emerging economies? This is such a powerful question. Um, it's so profound. And I think um, when we ultimately look back on the innovation of stable coins and we look back at the innovation of digital currency more broadly in a few years time, we're gonna see that it has become transformative for people in many, many economies in the world. Um, digital currency creates a way for individuals to uh, essentially elect what economic system they want to participate in with their smartphone. It gives people the freedom to transact with others globally, safely, securely, um, nearly free, in a nearly free way. It gives people the ability to participate in credit markets, in lending markets. Uh, in, in, in many, many other innovations that we haven't yet seen. And that's profound. It's as profound as the use of social media in the Arab Spring. Uh, it's, it's very profound. And I think that uh, you know, this technology innovation is, does have political consequences uh, that are going to ripple across the world over time. And they have in, in some instances. And I think this is something that um, at the end of the day, people and businesses, which is society, are going to, um, are going to vote for uh, what they think is, is, is allowing them to thrive in, in this uh, global economic system. And so uh, I think, uh, in my view, I think it can make a tremendous difference in, in helping people uh, store value, helping people safely transact, participate in global economic relationships. All of, all of these things are, are things that can then help to become more possible. Uh, moving back to uh, Twitter, um, let's see here. We have uh, a couple questions here. So this is from um, someone on Twitter named CryptoSec. Uh, <clears throat> As most enterprise deployments are currently on Corda, Hyperledger, Quorum, are there any plans to enable USDC on those chains, enabling settlement by financial institutions in USDC? Uh, so I think there's a couple key answers here. The first is that um, Center Consortium governs USDC as a, a set of technical standards and the overall arrangement for how it works. And Center Consortium, which, which uh, Circle is a member of, um, earlier this year published a, um, uh, guidelines on multi-chain USDC. And uh, in fact, just in recent weeks, um, the second official chain for USDC was launched, which was Algorand. And actually, as we talked about in, in, um, in Circle's uh, uh, blog post, and also I think in, in Center's communication around this, um, you know, one of the key use cases that uh, was attractive about Algorand in particular was that it was a, a blockchain that was designed very much with financial institutions in mind, with features and capabilities and scalability characteristics and other things that would be attractive to financial institutions. And what we've seen happen is with these quote unquote permissioned or private blockchains, 
I think they're all interesting conceptually, but at the end of the day, if you've got people who want to settle a transaction, you need to have digital cash on the blockchain. And so we've seen emerging demand from some of these types of projects for, for USDC. And so uh, Center Consortium, uh, again, defines a way for both um, you know, public blockchains and private blockchains and hybrid blockchains to be able to do this and implement USDC. In fact, we've seen some permission chain projects that uh, essentially, you know, peg USDC uh, that's on chain USDC to uh, a, a token that's used in, in a permissioned chain as well. So I think we're going to see a wide variety of models emerge for that. I think that pattern of public private and hybrid uh, especially in certain enterprise contexts, will emerge and become more common in the coming years. But at, at the end of the day, everybody, every enterprise, every financial institution, every individual is going to want to know that at the bottom layer of this, that there is a digital asset that they can settle on a public blockchain and that is liquid and convertible into the financial system. Uh, and so I, I, I think the, the adoption of standards um, and common protocols like USDC is really critical to that. And we're excited to see how projects like Corda and Hyperledger and Quorum and others adopt USDC going forward. Uh, another question uh, that came in, it's actually a related question. Um, this is from a former guest as well, uh, Itamar uh, Lusuis. Uh, the CEO of Argent, a really innovative crypto wallet um, and, and DeFi wallet. Um, and his, his first question was, uh, USDC has plans to launch an Algorand. What do you think needs to happen for a new layer one to seriously challenge Bitcoin and Ethereum? I think it's a, it's a great question. I think it's a question that's on the minds of a lot of developers right now. Um, there, there been, you know, obviously there's been tremendous growth in protocols that are built on top of Ethereum. Uh, the demand for those uh, and the usage of those has deeply strained the Ethereum network in terms of cost efficiency um, and, 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 and some other challenges as well. And, and that has, um, you know, these are sort of no known limitations and Ethereum 2, obviously, which is still in development in terms of of, of being able to really fully substitute protocol development on top of it, um, you know, for, for some time still, um, it, it certainly has raised this question of layer one, other layer one chains. And, you know, to be clear, um, as we conceptualized USDC and as Center Consortium has, has gone forward, you know, we think of it as a protocol that should be cross-chain. We think there's a tremendous amount of innovation happening in um, in other blockchains, and just like HTTP works on your iPhone and your Android phone and your Windows machine and your Linux machine, your digital money, your fiat digital currency should work across platforms and operating systems, and in this case, blockchain platforms as well. In terms of what really needs to happen for a new layer one to seriously challenge, you know, something like uh, Ethereum in particular. It really comes down to um, you know deployed applications and and developers getting benefits from that, um, and I think that we've seen obviously developers focused very heavily on DeFi, and I think um, we are seeing some chains emerge that I think are really attractive for DeFi applications. We're also seeing chains emerge that I think would be really attractive for running global capital markets infrastructure. Um, and uh, I don't think you're gonna run global capital markets infrastructure on uh, Ethereum right now. And so the, as the use cases for stable coins grow, the different chains uh, grow as well. I think w we are seeing demand, for example, from very large consumer payment companies that touch very large numbers of internet users uh, wanting to deploy stable coins as a payment medium and, um, and clearly new layer one chains are needed for that. Um, so I think it's a mixture of uh, developer adoption on, on chains that I think are really good for things like DeFi. Uh, I think it's major, uh, major industries like say capital markets or, or decentralized uh, capital markets or uh, use cases like um, payments or the issuing of securities or other things are gonna drive these new layer ones um, uh, in terms of bigger adoption. Um, 
I've got uh, another question here, which is from Kristen Smith, the founder of the Blockchain Association. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, her question, um, there's two questions here. So I, I think one is, if you could have a government agency take one action to support the adoption of USDC, what would that action be? Uh, and the second question uh, was, some policymakers want to see the US adopt a central bank digital dollar. How does this fit with USDC in terms of this policy goal? This is something that we've touched on in, in other episodes of the money movement, um, but it, it remains a, a really important um, topic. Um, so in, in terms of uh, you know, an action uh, of, a, of, a, of a government agency, you know, I think the, the really critical thing right now is um, financial institutions, whether they be fintechs that, you know, hundreds of millions of, of users and tens of millions of, of individuals in, in the US depend on or traditional banks, um, they, they need to see a path to using this in their infrastructure um, to see protocols like USDC on public chains as a, uh, a, a stored value financial instrument that they can have on a balance sheet that they can store that they can, um, you know, use and as a payment infrastructure. And so I think from my perspective, the a really key thing would be clarity from uh, perhaps the OCC around um, how the financial industry in the United States can actually interact with and utilize something like USDC. I think that's really critical. I think that's going to be critical as well for, uh, for, for Libra and, and associated stable coins from Libra. And so that's, that's I, I think, at the top of my list. Um, the second uh, question, which was sort of policymakers want to see the U.S. adopt a central bank digital dollar, you know, how does this fit? So I, I kind of look at these things on, on different timelines. I think right now um, there's one timeline, which is there's a huge amount of innovation in public blockchain infrastructure. There's a huge amount of private sector innovation around these types of digital dollar stable coins and the standards for those and the governance models around them and the risk management around them. So there's a huge amount of private sector work that's going on there and that's accelerating. Um, and that's one time frame. And so you can imagine what that might look like in two or three years and it could be quite significant in scale. Um, on the other hand, we have, I think, very important um, you know, considerations from policymakers, very important work being done by many different groups at the Federal Reserve looking at um, what is the, the, the federal government's role in digital currency in the future. And I think probably what, what we envision is that some point in the future, perhaps in two years, perhaps in three years, maybe faster, maybe slower, these things are gonna meet. And you're gonna, um, you're gonna see sort of the, the broad kind of industry driven arrangements, um, not just in the US, um, but we envision protocols like USDC being adopted by uh, uh, many jurisdictions for other digital currencies uh, with standards around them. So in, in many places, not just in the US, we're gonna see that the central banks are, are gonna to wanna to have some supervisory relationship with those arrangements and likely some relationship to the underlying reserves. And so the reserves that back a USDC, maybe eventually those are, are held with the Fed um, instead of within the commercial banking system. So those are questions that need to be thought of and addressed and I think we'll see um, develop in parallel and ultimately, I think in a, in a highly constructive, complementary fashion uh, over the next uh, two to three years. So that is it for today. We have so many other questions. Um, I think we've probably got another 50 questions here. So we are going to uh, come back to these. We're gonna record more on-demand episodes and get those out as quickly as we can because these are great questions. and. I want to answer them. Uh, so that bonus uh, on-demand uh, AMA, uh, stay tuned. Uh, stay tuned for that. And actually, the last question is a great segue into next week's episode. I'm very pleased to be joined by former CFTC uh, uh, chairman and co-founder of the Digital Dollar Project, also known as Crypto Dad, 
Christopher Giancarlo for a discussion on the digital dollar opportunity. Until next time, stay well, stay safe, and stay informed. Thank you. Thank you.